Summary of Against Happiness by Eric G. Wilson Creativity's Spur Ernest Hemingway, Jackson Pollock, Winston Churchill and Sigmund Freud, these cultural icons and historical heavyweights were true melancholics, or, more simply put, depressed people. In every age and in every walk of life, you can find countless examples of other exceptionally talented and notable melancholics, from leaders like Abraham Lincoln and Napoleon Bonaparte to celebrities such as Marilyn Monroe and Cary Grant. Indeed, if melancholia were a country, its population would include some of the globe's most brilliant intellectuals, artists, business titans and politicians. In some people, melancholy triggers stupendous creativity and achievement. Singer and composer Joni Mitchell calls it, the sand that makes the pearl. She claims that her best work stems from the gloomiest periods of her life. Mitchell respects, even honors, her blue states. She says, chase away the demons and they will take the angels with them, meaning that accepting, the dark parts, of herself is essential to recognizing and understanding the good. Former Beatles member and music icon John Lennon also penned many of his most memorable lyrics during times of great loss and sadness, such as when he divorced his wife and when his band dissolved. Many writers and artists created their greatest works during melancholy spells. Virginia Woolf claimed that her dark moods inspired most of her writing, including Mrs. Dalloway. And to the lighthouse. She said that such states exposed her to an assault of truth. Georgia O'Keeffe painted hills near Abiquiu and Ram's Head, White Hollyhock Hills after her melancholic breakdown. The paintings are among her most stark and powerful. They are proof of psychologist James Hillman's observation, depression opens the door to beauty of some kind the interdependence of opposites. Why do so many dreary and depressed artists generate works of great beauty and light? The answer lies in the intimate link between polarities. Psychologist Carl Jung researched this principle after reading the Taoist treatise, The Secret of the Golden Flower. Through his studies, he came to believe that two things that appear to be opposites often are really interdependent manifestations of the same principle. That principle, for Jung, was the unconscious. He saw it as the source of all intrinsically connected oppositions, including darkness and light, sadness and joy, and female and male. The brilliant and melancholic, Jung learned from his research that melancholy leads to understanding. He believed that it acts as a vital catalyst and springboard for insight and self awareness. Without melancholy, there is no shaping of identity. Jung concluded that melancholia is essential to mental health. Terrible beauty. John Keats wrote about the relationship between melancholy, beauty and death in his famous poem, Ode to Melancholy. The poet struggled with tuberculosis, an illness that claimed his mother and brother before him. Yet, he believed that, pain is the muse of beauty. In his poem, he suggests that you should not try to escape suffering through pills or suicide, but let it guide you to the realization that life's fleeting nature makes it beautiful. Melancholia enables people to perceive true beauty, and to differentiate it from what is merely pretty. Whereas beautiful things have a starkness and wildness about them, pretty things tend to look artificial and alike. Novelist Walker Percy claimed that most people go through life witnessing not the actual world but their preconceptions of it. Many inflexibly happy Americans show this disconnect in their attitudes toward beauty, as well as suffering and death. People's aversion to sadness and pain stems from their fear of dying. Connecting to your melancholy nature involves recognizing that everything and everyone is temporary. You must not try to escape your anxiety about death, but rather confront it and explore it. During the Middle Ages, people decorated their houses with memento mori, for Example, skulls and skeleton drawings, as a reminder of inevitable death. Funeral art from the Renaissance depicted grim reapers and bones. By dwelling on thoughts of finitude, you come to appreciate life's beauty and possibility. You become energized to live fully and creatively. A hunger for happiness. Melancholy sparks grand thought, sublime inspiration, and vital creativity. It prompts people to turn away from superficiality and to look deeper into the meaning of things. A melancholy mood keeps the mind questing, questioning and alive, leading to introspection and invention. In an increasingly shallow world, it enables people to stay in touch with reality. 
with these irrefutable benefits, you might think that more people would embrace their blue spells. However, this certainly has not been the case in the US. Most Americans do not accept their melancholy moods or view them as beneficial. Indeed, quite the opposite is true, they seek to eliminate them permanently. More than anything, Americans want to be, in the words of former Vice President Dan Quayle, happy campers. They tend to reach for antidepressants at the slightest sign of mental discomfort or anguish. Fearful of life's complexity and haziness, and terrified of death, they avoid melancholy at all costs. Perish the thought now has true practical relevance, at least in the US. Increasingly, Americans use a bewildering variety of psychotherapy options to banish their blues. Support groups of every stripe cater to the emotionally troubled. Most people view melancholy as a mental illness requiring medication or therapy. There is no question that clinical depression is real and that, for the severely depressed, such treatment is necessary. But is it healthy to completely eliminate sadness, a cathartic emotion? Many others see melancholy as a moral weakness and turn to motivational and self-help gurus for a cure. In a culture where happiness has become like a religion, these experts have gained the status of high priests and priestesses. Their maddeningly similar 10-step guides, CDS and lectures are ubiquitous. Americans have made sadness and despondency their enemy. Happiness is the nation's core concern, be happy or else, its motto. Those who strive for unending happiness essentially want to feel in control of their lives. However, as philosopher Alan Watts said, there is a contradiction in wanting to be perfectly secure in a universe whose very nature is momentariness and fluidity. Constant happiness is artificial. To truly experience life, you must accept its predictable dualities, its natural cycles of darkness and light, and melancholy and joy. To be a patriot is to be peppy. Americans have always placed a premium on happiness. The nation's first settlers sailed treacherous seas to reach a land they saw as a utopia. They pursued great bounty and the fulfillment of their dreams. The pilgrims' optimism never wavered, even though they encountered harsh, unsettled terrain and dangerous natives in the New World. They quickly formed religious communities that fostered faith in the triumph of happiness. Later, Leaders such as Benjamin Franklin promoted the idea that riches and happiness were available to anyone who worked hard for them. This quickly became the predominant view in the country. Indeed, the nation's founders wrote the principle into the Declaration of Independence, which grants all Americans life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. At the time, the happiest Americans were the property owners. The accumulation of land, wealth and possessions was crucial to early Americans' contentment. This principle holds true today, the US has become the ultimate, capitalistic paradise. The American dream e or nightmare. The pursuit of happiness at any cost has led to Americans disconnect from reality. They perceive things solely in terms of monetary value. The forests, fields, mountains and marshes have become commodities to trade and sell. Youth and beauty are things to purchase in the latest creams and salves. Education is merely a means to a salary. The result is a growing narcissism, Americans are becoming gods of a pleasure dome of their own making. American slavish devotion to happiness has paid off. According to research, almost 85% of US citizens claim to be happy. Yet, at the same time, the vital ozone layer is disappearing. Global warming threatens immense damage to the earth. Precious animal species are routinely becoming extinct. Forests and jungles that were once colorful and diverse are now becoming devoid of life, or they are vanishing altogether. Deadly terrorism is on the rise. Daily, politicians and the media blithely discuss possible nuclear war. Across the globe, poverty abounds. The list of dangers and suffering goes on. In spite of those dire problems and inequities, Americans continue to smile and be content. They persist in seeking new ways to escape reality. Their quest for everlasting bliss amid danger and misery makes them inauthentic and bland e silly, even. To live honestly and responsibly, they must recognize their deeper, more unsettling feelings about the world around them. Then, they can reap the benefits of those emotions, doubt breeds knowledge. Brooding breeds enlightenment. Fear breeds strength. 
Worry breeds action. Melancholy breeds creativity. The man of sorrows. Many of Americans' beliefs about happiness are linked to religion, in particular, Christianity. Therefore, a relevant question is, was Jesus happy? Most U.S. Christians envision him as an otherworldly figure untouched by the troublous globe. Popular religious leaders such as Billy Graham describe Jesus as a divine therapist who can quickly eliminate depression and other troublesome emotions. Graham even encourages people to pray to Jesus to remove their sadness, which, he maintains, is a result of sin. However, the four Gospels tell a different story about Jesus. Throughout his life, he was a man of sorrows. European paintings of Jesus, such as Matthias Grunewald's The Crucifixion and Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross, depict him in this light. Like today's melancholics, Jesus felt deep fear and doubt. Just before his death, he cried. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? His melancholic suffering on the cross led to his subsequent illumination. Carl Jung believed that Jesus' life is the perfect parable for how the psyche shifts from melancholy to self-awareness and knowledge. During Jesus' crucifixion, confusion and anguish overcame him. His suffering was necessary to his transformation. After three days in the tomb, he arose, a new being. Similarly, melancholic people move through phases of self-doubt and sadness toward a deeper and fuller understanding of themselves and their lives. Often, their gloomy states result in fresh insights and creative thoughts. The dark side. The dark, melancholic side of things has a certain genuineness and beauty. It is the metaphoric dwelling place of brooding geniuses and gifted artists. Can Americans long be satisfied with a shallow life of endless contentment? People need their fears, their sadness and their doubts. They require meaningful expression, not just superficial, empty toss-offs like, have a nice day. Americans' desire to wipe out melancholia poses a grave danger for their country. Visionaries benefit from melancholy states if science has confirmed the link between genius and depression. Therefore, America must not abandon its melancholy gene. Innovation, imagination and creativity depend upon it. Without the prompt of unsettling sadness and doubt, people will allow today's status quo to become the permanent status quo. The country will become a nightmarish dystopia of ubiquitous placid grins.